Hey, this is Sienna, Assistant Editor of Voice. In the following podcast, you'll hear the edited audio of my interview with Jay Martin during our Instaview series on Instagram. Jay Martin is a filmmaker and documentary producer. Recently, he made the documentary Red to Blue, which investigates the historic swing in 2017 when the Mansfield constituency swung from red to blue. We talk about political neutrality in artwork and how to make a winning kickstart campaign. Enjoy. Um, I'm really looking forward to finding out a little bit more about this documentary. Um, I thought maybe you could just start off with introducing yourself, um, what you kind of do in a day-to-day job um, and your role in this documentary that you've made. Sure, yeah. So the film is Red to Blue. Uh, it's a political documentary short film. Um, I'm a writer and director, I call myself. However, to this point, I have produced all of my own works as well, um, just due to being at sort of the low level at this stage. You know, I sort of self produce my own stuff, self fund it most of the time. And um, yeah, so that, that's the film. That's what I do. I also worked on music videos, uh, short films. The first film I ever made was a documentary called NG2 which uh, told the story of Nottingham's first serial killer. Um, so that was quite an interesting one. Pretty, uh, pretty ballsy project to do as a first one as well, but that was an interesting story. Um, and then, yeah, branched out from there. Amazing. Um, okay, so what is Red to Blue? I know a little bit about it, um, but I'd really like to hear how like, you would describe it in your own words. Okay, so I've described Red to Blue as it's it's the political story of how and why Mansfield, which is the town where I'm from, turned from Labour to Conservative for the first time ever in 2017. So it tells that political story, but then it also tells the story of Mansfield's heritage as well. We're an ex-pit town and we were born off the back of the coal industry, really. You know, Mansfield used to be back in its heyday in the 70s and the 80s, we used to be the epicenter for coal and um, like coal and manufacturing production in the entirety of the Midlands and the North. And slowly over the years, as the pit industry sort of left the town, we pivoted to something else. And that political change very much reflects that. So I'd say that Red to Blue is, it's definitely a political tale. It's a really interesting political story. And it's an important one as well to understand the reasons that led to this change taking place, whether it's good or bad is is sort of yet to be seen. Um, But yeah, really, really sort of two stories that synergize with each other throughout the film, yeah. Amazing. Um, before I get on to some kind of deeper questions into the making of the documentary and things like that, we did get a question. Um, we put a sticker on our story asking if anyone wanted to ask the questions. And Tom um, asks you, um, after this documentary, are there any upcoming projects you will be working on? There are, yes. So the next project, hopefully after Red to Blue, will be another narrative project. So my, I mentioned my first film earlier, NG2, my second film was a narrative short called Catharsis. And since I made that film, I've been learning how to screenwrite properly and developing my sort of skill in that area. But then I've also been writing my next narrative film called After Dark, which is a a film that deals with a, a character who's suffering with childhood schizophrenia. And he hears of a local poetry competition with a prize fund that he thinks is large enough to save his family from sort of incoming bailiffs and financial ruin. So that's a story that I've been working on for about three and a half years now. Um, And then also trying to learn the best that I can how to screenwrite and how to tell stories alongside writing this film. So hopefully with the hopeful successful reception of red to blue um that will be the the project that i'll i'll go on to after this yeah amazing um you must have been very busy for the last three years um with all yeah, of these yeah. it took a while <laughs> um okay so in red to blue um you used um footage that's from bbc archive from the 60s and 70s as well as contemporary footage um, that you filmed with your interviewees. Um, So explain more about the kind of juxtaposition of the 60s and 70s versus um, maybe 2017 and 80 when you were interviewing your candidates. 
Yeah, so the, the footage that we use from the BBC, the very expensive footage, I should say, um, that we use from the BBC is from a 1971 documentary film that was made about the Clipston miners' strikes, and it's called Strike Village. And within that documentary, it's sort of an hour long, I think it was originally part of uh, The Money Show, like way back in the 70s, and they did this whole hour long sort of piece on, on Clipston and the strikes. Um, but in making that documentary, they shot loads of footage of all these iconic sort of Mansfield locations back in the heyday in the 70s. So you've got places like, you know, our marketplace, which used to be this thriving sort of centre of commerce that now is basically empty. You know, you've got places like our oh, main piece of iconography the, for the film, the, the Clips and Headstocks. You've got places like that, which used to be this huge colliery used to employ thousands of people and is now just sort of the remnant and a monument to a, to a past industry. So me and my, my editor, Richard, actually came across it on YouTube while we were researching for some, some cutaways and stuff like that for the film. And we were like, we've got to use this because we've literally gone out and shot, you know, in 2019, 2020, we've gone out and shot these locations for the film, you know, to use as cutaways and, and stuff like that throughout the, throughout the film. So we were like, if, if we could get our hands on this footage, being able to make that juxtaposition to be able to show visually what Mansfield was like back in the day when the pits were roaring and there was money being made in Mansfield compared to now is, is quite an interesting and I think quite a powerful juxtaposition to make in the film. Um, so that was the reason that we, that we chose to use that footage and why I think it's, it's quite important to use that, to give viewers the context. Obviously for people who watch the film who are from Mansfield and know the area, they'll pick up on some of those locations, you know, but then for people maybe like yourself who aren't familiar with, with Mansfield, you can watch it and get the idea through what we're showing you with the visuals, you know, the, the change that this town has undergone. Amazing. That sounds, yeah, really powerful. Again, to give the context both to people who do live there and don't. Um, and yeah, that contrast from the election and from the past as well. Um, amazing. So could you tell us a little bit more um, about this footage? Because I know that you um, partially funded the documentary yourself. And then with the archives footage, which are very expensive, you then started a Kickstarter campaign. Tell us just a little bit more about um, the process of starting a Kickstarter campaign. Um, so the idea for the Kickstarter campaign, as you mentioned, I've up until this point, I've self-funded the project um, to get it off the ground because I'm not under the impression that anyone really, if I went up to a producer or, or you know, someone with money and said, I want to make this, this political documentary about an ex-pit town that's in the middle of nowhere, people aren't jumping you know, to fund films like that, unfortunately. Um, so my plan was to self-fund it, which I've done so far, I invested over £3,000 of my own money uh, into it at the minute. And that's all gone for paying for the crew, you know, just to get the film made. I've got an incredible team behind me that have been really, really supportive of the project and what we're trying to do. But then it got to the stage, as you mentioned, with using this archive footage from the BBC, they had to do work out a special rate for us. And that rate was £1,500 per 60 seconds of footage, which is insane, I think, um, for what we're trying to do, you know, as a film that isn't for profit, you know, we're not going to make any money. We're not going to be exhibited anywhere that is going to be making profit. You know, it's solely for the use for, you know, film festivals and online release. Mm -hmm. But that's what the BBC came back with. And as I mentioned, because this footage was so important for us to use, as was little news footage clips that we used throughout the film in election montages mm -hmm. to help establish yeah. the years that we discussed in the film, um, I looked to Kickstarter. And obviously I couldn't have picked a worse time than during a pandemic to, to launch a Kickstarter campaign, but we had it all planned from, you know, months in advance. So we looked to Kickstarter and I know a lot of people in Nottingham, my friends, my colleagues have done Kickstarter campaigns to fund their entire films. They've raised, you know, £10,000 upwards and they've had a lot of success with it. The Nottingham film community is, is very tight knit. We all sort of know each other, we're all friends for the most part and we all support each other when we've got projects going on. So I thought, you know what, it's £2,500 that we're looking to raise. It's not out of the question. So the Kickstarter campaign was something that I started looking at more seriously, started to develop. And obviously through that, we've done, we've done pretty well, a lot, a lot better than I thought we would. Amazing. That's really good to hear. And um, because, I mean, you say you've done really well. So um, it's during a pandemic, maybe you were thinking, oh, I might not raise as much as I had hoped to. 
Um, but because of success, what tips would you give young people who uh, they might not be able to afford to get their project off the ground and they need a little bit of help? So how would you suggest that they go about starting a Kickstarter campaign? So I think for me that the Kickstarter campaigns that I always respond to are ones where you can tell that people have put some effort into them from the get go. Mm -hmm. So I'd say even if it's shooting on your phone, if it's borrowing a camera or something from someone else, shoot yourself a good Kickstarter video. I was lucky enough to have Richard, our editor, who said, yeah, I'll edit it together for you. You know, we've got a lot of our footage and music and stuff already. So we've got a lot to play with. So a good Kickstarter video for me is essential because in my opinion, if I go to a film's Kickstarter page or any Kickstarter page and they're asking me, let's say for, for £5,000 to help them make their film and I watch their Kickstarter video and they've put no effort, maybe no money into that Kickstarter video, then that sort of puts me off because I think, well, why, why should I invest in you when you're not willing to, to put the effort into, you know, this quite basic thing, which is the Kickstarter video, your main piece of marketing. So that's the, that's the first one that I'd say is an, a really well-made Kickstarter video. I'd say keep your rewards quite basic, keep them clear and concise. And if you don't want any additional costs, keep them all digital. One of the things that I know that some of my colleagues have struggled with when they've done Kickstarters in the past is they've had these really great rewards where they offer people posters and pin badges and DVDs and all this great stuff, which is awesome. And they're really cool ideas, but then they cost money to make and to produce and to get out to people. So for me, when doing the Red to Blue Kickstarter campaign, I thought, I don't, I don't want any extra costs. You know, we can't afford any extra costs. So all of my rewards were digital. We kept it to five tiers, really basic, really straightforward stuff that you get, you know, so there's no confusion. Five pounds gets you a poster, 10 pounds gets you the film, you know, and upwards from there. Very simple stuff. Um, the other thing I would say is being active on social media. I've had, um, again, a friend, Ed, uh, Edmund who's joined the team as our graphic designer and he's made loads of cool little gifts little pictures to celebrate certain milestones that we've reached throughout the campaign and that perks people up and it gets people's attention to so being active you know rewarding people when they are donating and actually you know giving them a, a special shout out and stuff like that's really really important but Obviously, in our campaign, we've been quite lucky for the most part. I was not expecting the reception that we received. I thought we'd struggle in those two weeks um, to reach the 2,500. We actually ended up doing it in less than 12 hours on the first day of the campaign. So then I was like, oh, well, I've got two weeks worth of Kickstarter campaign here. What do we do? But, you know, as, as I'm sure you'll know, there's always more things to be paid for. So we released stretch goals, which we then smashed through in the second day. Um, and our current total is sitting at about five and a half thousand pounds at the minute. Um, and there's still more to go. You know, we've still got things to pay for. Um, so we're still raising money. We're still trying to trying to get the word out there about the film and about our Kickstarter. Amazing. Well, congratulations for, yeah, really smashing on goal. Um, I'm sure everyone's very excited to get the film out. And just going back to um, the documentary. Um, I, obviously, it's about it's about politics. Um, it's about the 2017 election. Um, you interview um, candidates from all part or many parties. So um, you've kind of tried to remain politically neutral for this documentary, which I think is interesting. So could you just explain like how you've gone about doing that, and maybe what it was like both for yourself and for the team as well? Yeah. So my, I suppose, like philosophy on it from the from the get go was the, the story of how and why Mansfield changed from red to blue was fascinating enough without the need for anybody else to inject their own political opinions into it. You know, yeah. the actual true story, you know, just the facts is, is really quite interesting on its own. So that was the approach that I always took. So obviously I have my own political beliefs. Um, nobody that's taken part in the film has any idea what they are. I've quite successfully managed to remain a bit of a chameleon, really. So I think at this stage, the Labour people think that I'm a Labour supporter, the Conservatives think I'm a Conservative supporter, and the people in the middle think that I support them. Um, that's the route that I've took. I've tried to be empathetic towards everyone's viewpoints and things like that whilst interviewing. You know, if you come in from the get-go and say, right, I believe this, 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 people shut up 
you know, they close up and they don't open up to you. So that was the approach that I took. It has been quite difficult because, like I say, obviously I've got my own views, my own political opinions. But I think at the minute in, in a lot of documentary filmmaking and I suppose uh, wider society, there's a lot of stuff that obviously leans one way or the other. And that's great. And that can educate you on certain things. But I think for this film in particular, understanding how and why this change took place in Mansfield, you know, it's got to be the viewpoint of straight down the middle because then you can actually learn something. Whereas if I go in from the get go and you know whose side I'm on, it, you know, you're going to get, you, you're switching off half your audience before they even got past the opening montage of the film, you know? So that was always the approach that I took. And I think that's the, the, the best way to approach a subject matter like this. But it has been difficult because obviously I've interviewed a lot of people with some quite extreme views, a lot of people with views that I don't necessarily agree with. So sometimes you just have to know when to sort of show up and just let them talk and, uh, and then just carry on the interview from there. But yeah, it's, it's worked quite successfully, I think, um, that approach. Amazing. And my next question would be, um, whether it's from an interview with a candidate um, or with the public, is there a particular story um, in the documentary, which has really struck you and kind of stayed with you um, throughout the editing process? There's a few, to be fair. Yeah, I think one of them that, um, that I've mentioned before is one of our interviewees, Catherine Fletcher. Um, she, her, her dad worked down the mines um, most of his life, and she told a story in the film about how um, her uncle got his leg caught in one of the machines, actually ended up losing his leg. And she was telling this story about the mines and it's, you know, it's this horrific story and you're like, man, like that's, that couldn't, it's something like that could never happen today in our workplace, that dangerous. But she was telling this story in a way that was so like, it was so truthful and like she was looking back on it quite happy and not like angry at the, you know, the mines or the mining industry or anything like that. Um, and that's a story that always stuck with me. We also had a guy that sort of came in quite last minute called Mick Newton who's a, a Labour supporter, he's a coalfield campaigner, worked down the pits for the majority of his life. And he like completely opened up to us and he's now sort of the main character of the film, really. He's like the narrator that takes us through. And he has some incredible stories about working down the pits, about Mansfield back in his heyday, you know, the nightlife, the, his political experience working with our previous Labour MP, um, le yeah, loads of different stories. It's, it's really interesting. Obviously, all of them can't make the cut in the film. Um, but the, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things. I mean, the main thing for me that it's made me think about a lot is, is having a bit more, um, I suppose, respect and reverence for the history of my town and our history in general. You know, whether we agree with the, the pits being closed down or not, you know, that's up for debate. Uh, it's still is up, is up for debate, you know, despite it happening predominantly in the 80s. But it's, it's definitely made me have a great appreciation for where my town's come from and sort of where we're heading now in the future. That's really good to hear. I think it's easy to kind of just see um, what's happened recently in recent government events. But then when you look back in the past, it helps you um, understand the context a little bit more. So that's really good to hear. Um, Moving on then, um, we're asking everyone who participates in these live interviews, kind of how have you found lockdown um, as an artist? How have you stayed artistically motivated um, or have you? And do you have any advice for young people who might be struggling on that front? Hmm. Yeah, I think for that is it. Two, two answers to that question. So on the one hand, because Red to Blue is currently in post-production, that's kept me pretty busy. So that's yeah. been ticking on with our editor and our composer and colorist, et cetera. So they've been sort of working on that continually throughout this process. So obviously for me, that's kept me busy with you know, phone calls, replying to emails, keeping up on those guys. But then another thing that I've been doing throughout lockdown is working on the screenplay that I spoke about earlier for the, for the film right. After Dark. And staying motivated on that is hard. It's hard anyway when you write a screenplay, but even so, um, some people respond, I think, better to being under pressure and having like a limited amount of time to work on something. I think I'm one of those people because in lockdown, I've got all this time and I, I have done work, but it's like, because you know, because there's, there's not that fire at your feet, there's not that thing pushing you forward, that deadline, you sort of get a bit, well, I get a little bit lazy with it. So I suppose my advice would 
to, to people would be always, you know, now that we've got this this time, obviously terrible what's going on at the minute in the world, but because we've got this time, try and set yourself some some deadlines, you know, and use that to push yourself forward. I always find that reading, I do a lot of like reading of like screenplay books and filmmaking books and stuff like that, as well as, you know, novels and stuff. Um, that always motivates me because I'm reading these stories about, you know, um, screenwriters of the past, how they overcome these different hurdles and how they write, et cetera, you know, and that sort of gives me that spark of inspiration, you know, when I've sort of got a day where I'm not really doing anything, then maybe I'll sit at the computer, I'll do a bit of writing and I'll push that story forward a little bit more. So yeah, I, th I think things like that, I mean, I'm not a motivational speaker, so I'm not too sure, but it's different for everyone, you know, like I say, thankfully, because we've had Red to Blue in post-production, we've had the Kickstarter and things like that going on that's helped to push me forward and sort of motivate me to get the film finished and, and keep moving, you know, in an artistic sense. Definitely. Um, yeah, so could you tell us a little bit more about what you've been reading, um, listening to, watching, um, and if you can give any recommendations to people who might be watching? So I've recently re-read re re Lessons from the Screenplay by William Goldman. Uh, so that's a screenwriting book. It's more, it's like a sort of pseudo biography, really, because he writes about the films that he wrote, you know, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Princess Bride, all these incredible films. Um, so he talks about those films, but then he also talks in the sense of what it meant working in the film industry at that time. So that's a really good book. It's actually one of the funniest books I've ever read. Uh, and it's not it's not a comedy book, but because Goldman's such a great writer, he sort of takes you through these stories and what he learned about screenwriting and all this crazy stuff. So that's one of the things that I've, I've really enjoyed. Um, a podcast that I started listening to um, was uh, Team Deakins podcast, which is run by the cinematographer uh, Roger Deakins and his wife, James. Um, that's a really great podcast and they, they obviously talk about their experience in the film industry much like the book lessons from the screenplay and they go sort of back and cover different topics every episode that's something that they've started during lockdown really really enjoyed that um i'm trying to think of a film or something that i've that i've watched recently that i quite enjoyed oh actually yeah i know what so the, at the weekend obviously with the the current protests that go rightful protests i should say they're going on the black lives matter protest me and my girlfriend watched a, a documentary on netflix called the 13th which is um about the 13th Amer uh, 13th amendment in america uh, the abolition of slavery um so that was a really good documentary educational really really like snappy it's um by the document by the filmmaker Ava, I think her surname is du Duvery, how you pronounce it, I'm not too sure. Um, but she also did the documentary series When They See Us on Netflix, which is about the central part of five that were wrongly accused of, of murder and this crazy like media sort of circus that went on around those those people. So that was a really good documentary. Yeah, I'd recommend watching that to sort of help educate yourself on on the current situation in the in the States and all over the world. Thank you. Um, we're just getting some questions in from viewers now. Um, we've got one from Tom who asks, who's your biggest influence in documentary making? Great question. That is a good question, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, hmm. I think there's a few. I mean, Nick Broomfield is always one of my favourites. Um, I like his run and gun approach to documentary filmmaking and how he sort of, he's a character in every one of his documentaries but he's always like the same you know he plays a character but it's, it's sort of him and he sort of embeds himself into this his films in a way and he actually came to the college that I studied film at and did a talk once about his film about Eileen Warnos and I remember I remember distinctly me and my friend Will have this memory of him talking about his documentary and then they went to play a clip from that documentary and he couldn't look at the screen because he developed such this this uh, really deep like emotional connection with Eileen Warnos, obviously this terrible serial killer, but it had affected him in such a personal way that he, he couldn't even bear to look at the screen when they played a clip of it uh, from the film, and that that really hit me and my friend um, at the time. I remember. So his like his personal connection to the material is something that I really appreciate. Um, so yeah, I'd definitely say, say Nick Broomfield. Also, local guy, uh, Ashley Carter, who's a documentary filmmaker. He's the editor-in-chief of Left Line magazine here in Nottingham. And he's a really, really great independent local documentary filmmaker. He's given me some great advice 
in the creation of Red to Blue and really, really helped the project along. So yeah, shout out to Ashley as well. He's, he's great. Awesome. Um, I think a question from, I think someone who's called Malik, um, who asks, what was the best part of making the documentary? Best part of making the documentary? Hmm. Yeah. I think it was actually getting to to learn a bit more about my town, to be fair, and actually getting out there with a camera and, and shooting some of these iconic places. Like I mentioned earlier, one of the, the main pieces of my iconography in the film is the Clipston headstocks, which are, you know, you've probably seen on all the promotional material, the huge symbols of a past industry that we have here in Mansfield, and actually getting up close with them and shooting them and trying to capture them in a way that makes them look as beautiful as I think they are as a monument to our past. Mm. It's something that I really, really enjoyed. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't quite think that ha having them on film does them justice because they're huge. They're really imposing. They sort of loom over the entirety of the town in quite, I suppose, a poetic way. Um, but getting, yeah, getting to, getting to, learn a bit more about my town and, and see it up close um, it's been really really great I think. Awesome and um, we have had a question from Helena who asked what inspired you to make a political documentary and um, I just encourage Helena to go this will be available on our Instagram TV so you can go watch, watch again we kind of covered that earlier on um, and we had another question from Malik who asked would you ever make a horror movie? Mm, I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. It's a good question. Um, I think maybe I had an idea for a horror film based off the video game series Silent Hill, which is this like, um, this sort of like, if you've ever seen this film Jacob's Ladder, it's like this psychological horror games. And they're really, really cool. They're really, really scary. Um, and I had an idea for like a little short film that takes place within that universe and takes some of the sort of elements that have been established in that that storytelling universe and sort of transition them into film in quite an interesting way. So yeah, so so maybe, yeah. So if I, if I ever develop that project to the point where it's ready to shoot, that might be something that I might look at there, definitely. Awesome. Okay, and um, the last question today is just where can people go to find Red to Blue um, and watch the documentary? Okay, so currently, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Kickstarter campaign is still live. So if you go to kickstarter.com and search for Red to Blue documentary, it's R-E-D-T-B-L-U-E -E, documentary, you can pledge £10 or more. And once the campaign ends, um, you'll receive a private digital screener of the film. So you'll be able to watch it before anyone else on your phone or on your computer or whatever. Um, so that's the quickest and probably best way to see the film. And if you'd like to support me and, and the film that we're making, that's, that's the way forward. Um, another way, to, to find out about Red to Blue through the Facebook page. So again, it's R-E-D-T-B-L-U-E -E documentary on Facebook and all of the updates uh, go on that social media platform. I don't have separate accounts on Instagram or Twitter or anything like that. It's all in one place on the Facebook page. And then if you'd like to find any more information, if you'd like to read any other interviews that I've done, anything like that, um, if you Google Red to Blue documentary, there's loads of stuff there. Um, you'll be able to find articles that have been written about the film interviews that I've done and sort of project updates, trailers, uh, anything and everything really. But yeah, I'd encourage people if they're watching and they haven't already, uh, they'd like to support the film, absolutely go to the, the Kickstarter page, consider pledging and, and helping us uh, get across that 6,000 marker before the end of the campaign. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for chatting with us today, Jay. It's been really, really interesting um, to find yeah, out more you. and I'm looking forward to watching it. So cool. thank you. <laughs> thank you. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Jay. You can find out more about the documentary on the Facebook page Red to Blue and Jay is on Instagram at jaythefilmguy. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe and review this show. And if you're looking for something new to listen to, then head over to our sister podcast, Voice Extra. Voice Extra, managed by our voice contributors, is a weekly podcast where they talk about the latest articles they've written and the art and culture they've been enjoying. Until next time, stay safe, stay creative, and we'll see you on voice.